All right, so let's do unit 13, thermodynamics. So if you guys notice, it's very similar to sounding to kinetics or not kinetics, sorry, thermochemistry. So it kind of is a combination of thermochem uh, with enthalpy and all that stuff and kinetics. So the first part, we're just going to review. Um, you guys don't need to write this down. This is your notes and it's pretty basic definitions. Um, so you guys know that the rate of the reaction is controlled by basically which energy level is favorable and talks about activation energy. Uh, lower activation energy means a faster reaction. Okay, you guys remember all this stuff, right? Um, chemical equilibrium, we know that basically when the rate forward and reverse rates are the same, that's when we're at equilibrium. And then just some reminder definitions. Um, enthalpy is heat transfer in a reaction. Uh, temperature is the amount of kinetic energy, so how much the molecules are vibrating. And then heat is when energy goes from one substance to another substance. You guys remember these terms? Maybe not the nuances, but they should be familiar. Um, and you can always review this uh, whenever you need to. You guys don't need to write down, okay? So um, the key thing about thermochem is that thermochem is where we study energy relationships and why reactions go in the direction they want to go. So for example, if you burn a candle, Right. If you captured all the gases of that candle and put them in a container, would you expect the candle to reform? No. Right. And so thermodynamics is the reason why. Why doesn't it form come back together? Or like if you put a piece of ice, you know, on a plate and it melts, would you expect the water molecules to refreeze in the sun? No. Right. That's kind of what thermodynamics is. Is why reactions proceed in the way they they do. Okay. All right, so that's what thermochem is. Now, a couple things to remember. Uh, energy transfers happen because molecules collide with one another. So molecules collide, the kinetic energy transfers, and um, that has that obviously changes temperature, um, its heat flow, it changes the speed of the molecules, and then you guys remember exo and endo. Okay, so that's kind of the review. Um, now we're gonna talk about the actual uh, meat of the unit, okay? Okay, so... Um, the first thing we're going to talk about are called spontaneous processes. And uh, spontaneous processes are guided by the first law of thermodynamics, which means that energy is conserved. So you cannot create or destroy energy. You guys probably heard this in your other science classes um, before. So energy can be converted or changed from one form to another, but the total energy in the universe or the system you're looking at, is, as long as it's closed, is always going to be the same. Okay. So based on that, what we're talking about right now are spontaneous reactions. It's reactions that proceed on their own without any outside assistance. So for example, if I was holding two eggs, I was holding it. And then if you just let go, what would be the spontaneous reaction? They just fall, right? It would not, you would not expect if you put your hand out over two broken eggs for the eggs to come back up and to reform, right? That's not a spontaneous reaction. That would require a lot of outside help. So spontaneous reactions are things that kind of go on their own without any outside assistance. Uh, Non-spontaneous processes are just a reverse and they don't happen on their own, okay? So a couple examples, eggs falling like we just talked about, um, gases expanding in a container. Uh, so the good example is like if I farted, it would eventually spread, right? And then you wouldn't expect it to come back to me, right? Um, iron rusting, ice melting into water, those are spontaneous. The reverse of these things are not spontaneous. They need some outside assistance in order for those things to happen. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. How is ice melting into water spontaneous? Yeah, so this is spontaneous because um, we're assuming that the system is like set. This is obviously assuming like above melting temperature. Yeah. Um, and so this would be the spontaneous because if you have ice, at melting temperature, it would go from H2O solid to H2O liquid without any outside assistance. It would be absorbing energy from the system, um, but then the energy would be in the water molecules themselves. And so that absorption of the kinetic energy from the from the air around it would be the spontaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Within your system. Yeah. Like you wouldn't need to go in to force it to melt. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. What if I put like water and ice in the train and put it into my freezer? So, so it depends so. depends how you define the system. So if the system is inside your freezer, then that would be spontaneous. But if the system was 
you know, including your free freezer, then you would say, oh, it required the electrical energy, right? Um, to go into the freezer that converts it into thermal energy and then it would freeze. So yeah, so it depends on how you define the system. For our purposes, we'll be talking within the reaction itself. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay, let's move on. There's a lot of definitions in the beginning, so I apologize. Um, so again, like we were saying, we have to define the system um, and the experimental conditions. So like Vivian and Robbie just pointed out, um, ice, this, this reaction, ice going to water and back, um, when it is greater than, uh, what is it, melting point. So when it's higher than melting point, the spontaneous reaction will be melting, right? But if it was under the melting point, then it would freeze and that would be the spontaneous reaction. What's up, ladies? Okay, so yeah, just remember it's important to define your system, define your conditions before you talk about spontaneity, okay? All right, let's uh, go into the practice problems. So I'll do one with you guys, excuse me, and then I'll have you try the other ones on your own. So 13.1, uh, basically we just need to figure out if it, if these systems are spontaneous or reactions are spontaneous the way they're described, spontaneous in the reverse direction or at equilibrium. Okay, so let's talk about 13.1. So uh, water, that's 40 degrees Celsius. It gets hotter when you put a 150 degrees Celsius piece of metal. Okay, is this spontaneous or is the reverse spontaneous? The reverse would be um, if the energy, what is it? if the energy goes back into the metal. So the, okay, maybe I'll draw it. My side pictures, you guys need a picture. 40 degrees Celsius water, right? You put a 150 degree piece of metal in it. The system that's being described is the energy going from the metal to the water, right? So the reverse would be energy going from the water to the metal, okay? so. Which reaction is spontaneous? Metal to water or water to metal? Metal to water. metal to water, right? So the way it's described here, A, that's going to be the spontaneous reaction, right? Obviously, it wouldn't make sense for energy to go from the water to the metal. In order for the water to give energy to the metal, you would have to add energy by heating up the water, right? And that's how the water would be able to give energy to the metal. Okay. So that would require outside help. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Uh, I'll give you guys about three minutes to try 13.2, 3, and 4. Uh, you can check with the person next to you. We'll go over it together, and then we'll move on. All right. So if we take a look at 13.2, uh, it says water at room temperature decomposes into hydrogen and oxygen gas. So easiest way to tell if it's spontaneous or the reverse is spontaneous is just look at it and see and ask yourself, does this happen on its own? So if you have water, right, you have a cup of water at room temperature, does it turn into H2 and O2 gas? No, it does not. So that means that here, the reverse is spontaneous. Okay. That'd be very dangerous because these are both very flammable gases. Yeah. So if this happened at room temperature, then yeah, not good. Okay, let's go to 13.3. Um, we got benzene at 1 ATM condenses from gas to liquid at the normal boiling point, okay? Would this happen on its own? Would it go um, from, what is it? From gas to liquid at the normal boiling point? Yeah, no, it would not, right? Because it's at boiling point, okay? We start at the gas, okay? Oh, sorry, I misread it. It's at the normal boiling point. So it's at here. So if it's at boiling point right here, and we're at a gas, this is actually spontaneous at equilibrium because um, at boiling point, this is the point where you're kind of, you have the same amount of molecules turning into a gas, the same amount turning into a liquid. So you, if you're at the boiling or melting point, you have this basically an equilibrium of the molecules shifting between the two phases. Sorry, I misread that guys. It's at the boiling point. So here, this is spontaneous at equilibrium. It's because it's at the boiling point. Yeah, the wording was tricky. Got me too. Okay. And so if we contrast that with number four, it says that it's below the boiling point. Okay. So if we have a gas, okay, turning 
into liquid, would that would it turn from gas to liquid if we change the temperature to below the boiling point? Yes, it would, right? That's kind of the definition of the boiling point. If you have a gas, you lower the temperature to below boiling point. This is where the molecules start turning into gas or all of them turn to gas. Uh, if you put the temperature underneath it, it's going to condense into a liquid, okay? Yeah, going from gas to liquid. If it was above, then the reverse would be spontaneous. Yeah. Because you would have to add something into the system to bring the temperature down, to turn the gas into liquid. All right, but spontaneous spontaneity makes sense. It's basically what's going to happen given the circumstances on its own. Okay, let us move on. Okay, so a uh, couple things that we'll be talking about a lot this unit, and you guys might want to write this part down. Um, the three, I guess, primary variables that we talk about in thermal chemistry, and we'll explain all of them um, as we go on. Um, the first is enthalpy change. You guys know about that, right? Energy change from beginning to end. Um, entropy change. We'll talk about that more in detail. And free energy change. Okay, so just be comfortable with the variables because none of the variables are the first letter, right, of the things. So H for enthalpy, S for entropy, and G for free energy, okay? And we talk about these processes because they're called state functions, which means they depend only on where you end and where you begin, okay? So if we had a graph of like, for example, the enthalpy change, right? Over time, the enthalpy change could be like, like that, but we only care about how much this change was, the final and the initial. We don't really care about the steps in between. We just care about the change between the initial, oh, sorry, initial should be lower. Um, the initial and the final. That's what a state function is. It's variables that only have to do with where you end and where you begin. We don't really care about all the stuff in the middle. All right, so um, those are the three variables you guys want to keep in mind. Um, and then a couple things to mention about them is that on the AP exam, when we talk about these three properties, they're almost always for when you're at standard state conditions. And so these are this is the definition of a standard state condition. Um, you guys don't need to write all this down. Um, usually we can assume it, but I'm just telling you this so that you're aware. Um, gases, one ATM. Liquids and solids are pure, so they're not mixtures or anything. Um, the concentration for solutions are one molarity. Energy formation is zero, and temperature is room temperature. So 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin. Okay. So if you see this little uh, degree sign, this little exponent zero O, um, that means it's for standard state conditions. And this is how you'll usually be given um, information on the AP tests, okay? All right, sorry guys, a lot of definitions, right? A lot of little, little things. So we're gonna move on now to enthalpy of formation. Uh, we actually learned this before. Um, I'm just gonna be kind of reviewing. Um, but enthalpy of formation is uh, the change in energy that takes place when one mole of a compound is formed from its pure elements under standard conditions. Maybe you guys remember this. So for example, if we have the enthalpy formation of this compound right here, meth methanol, um, we just look at the elements that make it up, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then we just write the equation for them in their pure substances. So carbon, the pure substance is solid, oxygen is gas, hydrogen is gas. And so we just have to write the equation like that, okay? And then for these, just make sure you remember it's always for when you have one mole of product. That's why we have the half 
with the oxygen? It's because we need to balance it for one mole of product. What do you mean by one mole of product? So when we write the equation for enthalpy of formation, we just always need to make sure we balance it with, but then the product is always just going to be one mole. Yeah. And I'll show you guys what that means in just a second. Okay. So here, um, if you guys remember, for these ones, you have to look up the values um, for these guys. Uh, we'll do a problem in just a second. But this isn't something you need to memorize. You'll have to just look up the values, or they'll, they'll be given to you. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, and you solid graphite. Okay, so let's go. Um, I'm going to skip all this. I think it's easier if we just do the problem. So we're going to do the problem. So what I want you guys to do is just take a second to copy down this equation. Uh, as you guys noticed, I have the enthalpy of formation given for you. You don't need to remember it. And I'll just show you guys how to find the enthalpy change for this reaction. And then we'll move on to entropy. Okay, so if you want to find the enthalpy change for this reaction, all we got to do is take um, the energy enthalpy of the products and then just subtract the reactants. So um, the equation, if you guys saw up there, is going to be the sigma of the products minus sigma. This is sum of the reactants. Okay, so very easy. Um, all we got to do is take a look. Let's start with the products. So what we're going to do is we're going to write this equation, the enthalpy change is going to be all the products. So if we take a look at the products, we got CO2. And then it tells you the enthalpy of formation of CO2. And it's two moles, right? So all we're going to do is 2 times negative 394 plus 4 times okay, water vapor, which is negative 242. And then we're just going to be subtracting the sum of the reactants. So the reactants here is two moles of uh, methanol. So two times negative 201. And then you guys don't need to write this. I'll just do it for the sake of completion. You got three moles of oxygen, which is zero. Okay. So if you guys notice, this is the enthalpy of formation of the products minus the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. And then you just need to solve this equation, and that will give you um, the enthalpy change for the entire reaction. Does this kind of ring a bell? We did this in like unit six or whatever, thermal thermal chemistry. Okay. And I'll give you guys the answer because it should be pretty easy to solve. Um, the answer will be negative uh, 1354, and that'll be kilojoules per mole. Okay. Okay, so based on what we calculated, is this an endo or exothermic reaction? Exo, yeah, it's going to release energy because energy is leaving the system, it's leaving the reaction. Okay. Um, so, so if we take a look at part B, uh, we're finding the enthalpy of combustion for one mole of methanol. So this is actually pretty easy. Um, if you take a look at the balance equation, how many moles of ethanol are we talking about here? Two. So if you want to find the enthalpy of combustion for just one mole, what do you got to do? Yeah, divided by two. So 1354 divided by two. So it's negative 677. Yeah, so if you... Did more work than that, I am sorry, but it should be just this. And then the unit you know, of measurement will be one mole of ethanol. But if you just did 677 kilojoules, that's fine as well. Okay. And again, it's because there are two moles of ethanol in the balance equation. Um, but the question is just asking us for the one mole. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Easy PC? Okay. Um, so that's just kind of like a mole ratio question. Yeah. Combustion of, so this is being combusted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at C now. Um, so C, we are turning five gram, or we're taking five grams of methanol and we're trying to figure out how much heat is released. Okay. All right. This one, I'm going to 
can I erase all this stuff up here? Or do you guys still need it? Okay, I'm gonna erase it just so we have uh you guys can see it a little bit better. Um, but what we want to do, oops. Okay. What we're gonna do is we're basically just doing some stoichiometry. We're gonna take our starting number, which is five grams of uh methanol. And what we want to do is we want to convert it into heat. And so what we want to do is we want to turn it into kilojoules. Okay. So we're going to set up some fractions in order to do that. So we have grams. And so we need to convert this into moles because that's what we're talking about in this reaction. Um, so we're going to find the molar mass of methanol. That should be uh, 32 grams of methanol for every one mole. Okay. All right, what we want to do now is we want to uh, now scale it for the reaction. So here we have one mole of methanol. Okay, but in the reaction, how many moles of methanol are we working with? Yeah, two. two. So it should be, sorry, it should be two on the bottom because two moles for every one mole of the reaction. So if we're looking at one of these reactions, you got two moles of methanol in there. And then for every one of these reactions, I guess maybe instead of moles, we'll just write one reaction. For every reaction, um, what is the energy change? Yeah, negative 1354 kilojoules. Yes. Um, I just did like, like the one mole. The thing From part B? Six. Yes, that, were, that would be perfectly fine too. So if you just did this and then what was it? Negative 677 kilojoules for every uh, two moles. Oh, sorry, one mole. Muffle, muffle. Yeah, one mole. One mole of uh, methanol. That's totally fine, too. Okay. Or if, if you wanted, you could have just moved this over right here and just replaced this. That works as well. So a lot of different ways to do it. Um, But yeah, this could work. Um, Let me write the other option that works. The other option you could have done is uh, two moles of methanol is negative 1354. That works as well. So any of these three reactions would, or equations would work. Are you going to get more points? No. The You'll, like showing the whole thing? Nope. So it'll be 106 kilojoules, regardless of what you do. What really matters is the end value and that you found the viable way to find it. If anything, this is probably the most complicated one. So you guys probably did one of these too. Okay. So just a little refresher on Stoic. After this next test, we'll be back at it with Stoic. Is yeah. there like how much? I know you said like the majority of the test is going to be like the last unit. Acid base, yeah. But like how much is it going to be like this and stuff like that? Stoic? Yeah. It'll usually be integrated into the problems. Um, So you will there's not too many like pure stoic questions, but identifying things like mole ratios, converting between molar mass, things like that, molarity, there'll be a lot of that. Yeah, converting from molarity to moles, mole ratio back to a different concentration, with different volume, there'll be stuff like that. So if we saw like a like an energy problem, like we didn't know how to do the whole problem, but it talked about like converting, if we like just do right out the stoic, would that be get some sort of points like? Would they get as much if we like depends on the problem you have to be going in the right direction so like let's say like for example if we had something like this and then you just did the full stoic for like energy then you would get partial credit because you're still as long as you're looking for um still enthalpy of combustion which is kilojoules and so it has to be kind of going in the right direction yeah usually writing more is not better though yeah if anything it'll annoy them yeah Okay, uh, ready to move on, guys? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so we talked about enthalpy, kind of a refresher. Let's talk about entropy now. Now, entropy is a measure of randomness or disorder in the system. Okay, so the bigger the number for entropy, S, um, the more disorder or more randomness there is in a system. Okay, so easy way to think about this is let's talk about water again if you have a little ice cube right okay it's a solid versus we have a water vapor okay 
which one do you think would have more disorder or randomness in the way the molecules are organized? The gas, right? Obviously, the gas has more randomness because they're constantly flying around, right? There's more randomness. So this guy right here would have a greater value of S than this guy relative to this guy right here. And that's kind of the gist of entropy. Now, we can start talking about like quantum mechanics and like really complicated things with this, but... All you really got to know is that it's disorder. It's how random the molecules are organized and moving around, okay? And then you can calculate it the same way. Um, you guys don't need to write this equation down. Anything that's delta is sum of the products minus the reactants, okay? And then one thing you might want to jot down somewhere is entropy is always positive. So if you do a calculation, you get a negative entropy value. You did something wrong um, because zero entropy is there is no disorder. That's absolute zero. That's physically impossible. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to the last one now. The last variable we talked about is Gibbs free energy, G. Okay, and Gibbs free energy is basically a measure of whether or not something will happen without the input of uh, outside energy. It's a measure of spontaneity, okay? So basically it's telling you whether or not, it measures whether or not a system, uh, a process is gonna be spontaneous or non-spontaneous and we got a value to go with it, okay? And the key thing to write down, if delta is delta G is negative, the reaction is favored. So if you get a negative value for G, that means it's going to want to do it because uh, systems want to go to low energy. But if the change in G is positive, you're going to have to put energy into it. It's not thermodynamically favored. Okay, so if you guys want to use some shorter language, this is spontaneous. Okay, if delta G is uh, negative, it's spontaneous. And then here, this is non-spontaneous. Okay. So those are the three variables um, that are very important for this unit. Um, hopefully it'll make more sense as we do problems with this and start putting number values to it. So what is the free energy? If free energy measures whether a process will happen on its own, or you got to put energy into it. You got to put energy into it, yeah. That's like the spark notes definition, I'd say. All righty, guys. So um, that's Gibbs free energy. Let's go into talking about the relationship between all three of the variables together. Okay. Now, uh, make sure you guys write this equation down uh, because this is going to be the equation we'll be working with um, for a while now. Okay. So just make sure you guys have this written down. So Gibbs free energy, the change in delta G is equal to delta H minus absolute temperature times delta S, okay? And we'll talk about all the implications that come with this equation in just a second, but this is basically a way for us to calculate whether a process is uh, spontaneous or not spontaneous by looking at the other three variables. Okay, so, so this we, is the equation we have to... Um, I think it's on your uh, equation sheet, actually, but... You're going to use it so much, this unit, and you'll actually have to use this probably a lot on the test. Yeah, it's on your equation sheet, too. Yeah. But you'll probably end up memorizing it at a certain point. Okay. Now, a key thing to note about this is that the temperature is absolute, so make sure you change Celsius to Kelvin uh, before you work with it. Okay. And as you guys are copying that down, let me talk very briefly about um, this equation. 
Um, so you guys probably know this from our other discussions previously, but nature and just everything, they basically move towards two states. Um, they want everything wants to be low energy and high disorder. Okay, so it wants to be very low energy and it wants to be very random. Okay, so easy way to think about this, um, since my dog's gonna die soon. Um is let's talk about my dog okay 15 yeah it's it's about time okay so we got my dog yeah we got my dog okay. thank you i don't like it looks like it's like a wiener dog that torso is very long anyway we got my dog right right now this thing has high energy right and it has low disorder right the things that make up my dog aren't just in random places. For example, like its tail isn't automatically going to randomly move to its you know, mouth or anything like that. It's very low disorder. It's a very complicated, very organized system, right? But one day, hopefully soon, my dog's going to die. I just don't like my dog. It's not even my dog. Okay, it's going to die. Okay, now... The lo my dog dies. We're not going to do anything. Let's say we don't do anything to the, my dog, right? It dies in the middle of a field. There's no... Uh, it's a Jindo. It's a Korean breed. Didn't I show you guys pictures? Anyway, whatever. Actually, let's say my dog dies and then we put it in like a, a box, okay? There's no bacteria, nothing like that. It's not super hot or anything. And then we put the dead body there, okay? Now, okay, we'll just say it's a box. Okay, what's going to happen is eventually what's going to happen to the cells and everything inside of my dog. Yeah, it's going to decompose, right? And so my dog, the energy inside my dog, it's obviously going to drop, right? The body heat is going to dissipate into the gas molecules around it. Um, and then let's talk about the randomness. Eventually it's going to decompose. The cells are going to break down. The water is going to come out. Probably some poop's going to come out, right? And then eventually my dog, if you leave it long enough, is going to be just a little, some sludge on the ground, right? So the cells are broken down, atoms are broken down. It's just kind of a thingy, a puddle on the ground. And so it's going to have very high disorder. Okay, so that's a way you can visualize. Now, when you think about this, you can think about my dog. I need to make the example more, like, help me understand. I need to see the picture No, I'll show you later. Okay. <laughs> I don't like that thing. Anyway, so yeah, that's basically how nature moves now. Um, we can think about this in terms of how the universe expands too, right? Um, the universe is expanding. All everything is basically moving away from each other, right? Higher randomness. Um, everything is getting colder in the universe. Uh, generally, the energy is decreasing, and so or not the absolute energy, but energy in certain in different systems are decreasing. Okay, so that's basically uh what nature likes to move forward into. And this equation kind of helps us visualize that. So you guys do not need to memorize this table. Um, this is just kind of me organizing everything that we can derive from this. So for example, if you read a problem and you can figure out the enthalpy is positive, that this is negative, right? This part right here is negative. Then we can obviously calculate that delta G is gonna be positive, right? Because minus minus turns into plus. You put two pluses together, you get plus. Make sense? That's basically what this table is. You don't need to memorize it unless you really need to. And then plus means that it is not spontaneous. Okay, that's what this table teaches or is kind of organizing the information of. It's just what we're gonna get it depending on the values of these numbers. Yeah. In the first table, unless you really want to. Sorry, uh, my bad. Would you yeah. recommend uh, no, because if you have this, you'll have this equation with you on the equation sheet. And then if you can tell, you can just put like, it's a positive, it's a negative, right? You can just figure that out. And I think it's easier to kind of just figure, use that as a method instead of trying to like, remember all this. Yeah. Okay. And again, uh, positive uh, G means that it's not spontaneous. Negative means that it is spontaneous. Okay. All right. Let's go into some problems now. So this is kind of going to lead into the next unit as well, redox and electrical potential, okay? 
Now, uh, write this equation down as well. And I'll talk about what this means. So a big part of the AP test, they really like, for some reason, I really don't like them, um, but they really like putting redox reactions inside of the AP test. Do you guys remember redox? You remember the word, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about what redox is in just a second. Oxidation reduction reactions, yeah. But they love redox. They love bringing up redox with acid base. They love redox in electrochem. Well, that's because of redox. In solution stuff, they love redox and they love redox in thermodynamics as well. Okay, so we'll be talking a lot about redox. You'll see it in the FRQs that we go over during the review month. Um, but this equation right here basically allows us to figure out if a process is spontaneous or not. Um, by looking at a redox reaction, okay? So let's go over the variables here. So delta G, we've been talking about this. If it's negative, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's not spontaneous. Okay, this N value right here is the moles or the number of electrons exchanged in that reaction, okay? So if two electrons move, we're going to plug in two for N. If it's three, three, whatever, so on and so forth. F is a Faraday's constant. So this right here is always going to be this value right here. F is always going to be 96,500 Coulombs per mole. Okay, and it's talking about moles of electrons. Okay. And then this E value will usually be given to you. Okay, it's voltage. It's going to be written next to the equation. So let's say you have a chemical equation, right? Okay, it's going to be like, it's going to be written next to it. Okay, the E value will be written next to it. And if you notice, everything is being multiplied here. And so by taking a look at just the E, we can tell if it's going to be spontaneous or not. If E is positive, that means that it is spontaneous. And if E is negative, it's going to be non-spontaneous. Okay, and you do not need to memorize this equation. It's gonna be on your equation sheet as well. Okay, just be comfortable using um, the equation and we'll go over a problem right now. And we'll be talking about redox again. <laughs> I know. I hate chemistry too. No, chemistry is fun. We always talk about this. I have not, I have not brought it up in the last two times. The last time it was not been. No, okay. Come on, Robbie. <laughs> Whenever you say I hate chemistry, I was just thinking. Yeah. Could have done something else with my life. Answer, always, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I could have been like a fool. Could have been a doctor. Could have been a lawyer. Could have been a pro StarCraft player. Oh. I don't want to do this. No. I don't think about it when I go home. I just want to enjoy my life and not think about it. It's true. Nothing changes. It's true. I do. I'm a, I'm a professional athlete. No, I'm just playing, guys. I love, I love, on the real, I love this job. It's like the best job. We are. Oh, no. They should be paying me more. But we are overpaid. All right. Let's uh, move on to the problem. So 13.6. Okay, we're going to be using the equation we just learned. Okay, now, before we use the equation, though, um, we need to figure out a couple things. So let me just uh, jot it down so that I have it or so that we have it as a reference. And we're just going to start filling in the numbers. Okay, so we got delta G. Go to negative N, F, okay, and E. Now, um, if you take a look at this equation right here, we have all the variables except one. What's the one variable that we don't have right now? Yeah, we don't have N because this is a constant, right? So we can just plug in the value, 
this is given to us right here. Um, now, before we start, let's take a look at the uh, E value. And if we take a look at the E value, uh, we can tell whether this reaction is spontaneous or not. Is this spontaneous or non-spontaneous? It's spontaneous. Yeah, we know that because this is positive, which means that our total value will be negative, which means a spontaneous reaction. So this is going to be a spontaneous reaction. And we can figure that out just by looking at the E. Now, that's not what the question is asking us about, but that's some important information we can derive. What we need to figure out now is the N, the number of electrons that move, okay? So we're gonna review redox real quick, and I'm gonna teach you guys the acronym that I use um, in order to remember redox. I'll teach you two of them, okay? The first one is oil rig, okay? Oil rig, yeah, oil rig stands for oxidation is loss and reduction is gain, okay? So whatever compound loses electrons is being oxidized. Whichever one gains electrons is being reduced, okay? Hopefully this rings a bell and that's all you really need to know for oxidation reduction. Now you can look at any equation and figure out which one is being oxidized, which one is being reduced, okay? The other one, I don't like this one because it doesn't really make sense, is Leo Gurr. Oh, not Geg. <laughs> Gurr. And same thing, loss of electrons. That's oxidation. If that makes if this helps you remember, that's fine. Gain electrons is reduction. So basically set, communicate the same thing. That was lame. Yeah, I like Orwood because that's an actual term. Um, but if some people really like Leo Gurr because tigers or not tigers, lions go Gurr, I guess. Yeah, it whatever works best for your strange brain, that's fine. Leo Gurr, yeah. <laughs> Leo Gurr, Lions go Gurr. Okay. All right. So based on that information, I'm going to give you guys a minute to see if you guys can figure out how many electrons move in this oxidation, this redox reaction. So which compound is being oxidized? Ooh, uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. So we got to figure out which one is losing electrons. So Electrons are what, positive or negative? Negative. So if I lose things that are negative, do I become positive or negative? Positive, right? Just like how when you leave this class, you are going to lose me, this negative influence in your life, and you are gonna become positive and happy again. And so here, this compound right here, Zn, is going to be oxidized. You lost all the Okay. I lost all what? No, yeah, Why? Dude, this is like the first time, bro. <laughs> I think I've been more wrong than Ian, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Okay, granted, I talk a lot. I talk a lot more. God bless you. So statistically, I will be wrong more. But yeah, so uh, zinc is being oxidized. Um, silver is being reduced. And so we can look at the charges to see how the electron, how many electrons are moving. So if zinc loses electrons and become positive to how many electrons moved? Two. Yeah, two electrons. Okay. And then that's why we needed two silver uh, metals because they basically went from the zinc to the two silver atoms. Okay. So our value for N is going to be two. So super easy to plug in here. We just plug in two. Um, Faraday's constant is nine, six, five hundred. Okay, coulombs. And then we got positive 1.56. And then you'll get a total value of negative 301,000 joules per mole. <laughs> hey, no laughing. No happiness in this class. Okay. So that's how we can calculate um, the delta G value and spontaneity for a uh, redox reaction. And We'll be doing this next unit, so just make sure you're comfortable. Um, if you need to go back and review redox a little bit, it might be helpful. Um, but if you remember oil rig or Leo Gurr or whatever, 
Um, should be fine. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, let's move on to the next question. Now, we for thermodynamics, it's very important for us to uh, remember how to do Hess's law. So we're going to review it before we move on. Um, Hess's law is basically where you get a reaction, you get the steps for that reaction, and you got to figure out what the total enthalpy change is. Okay. Do you guys want to try this on your own or go over together? Okay. <laughs> Let's go over it together. Okay. So uh, we're going to figure out the enthalpy change for reaction one. Now, um, we're going to, I'll copy it down with you guys so that, you know, I, I don't get too far ahead so you guys can't pay attention. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take these rea reactions right here. We want to organ re rearrange them or organize them or flip them um, in order to, produce this reaction right here. Remember? Okay, for sure. Okay. Okay. Nice. You want to do it on your own? Okay. I tried. Okay. So how about this? I'll do it up here, but if you want to try it on your own, you can ignore me and then you can check your answer at the end. Okay. Okay. But uh, what we want to do is first, we want to take a look at reaction one and figure, and then look for these compounds in the other reactions that we're working with. Okay. So we got N2H4. So which of these reactions has N2H4? Reaction two. And so we want to just make sure that it's on the correct side of the equation. So if you take a look at it, they're both on the reactant side. So we can just kind of copy this down exactly the way we have it for now. Okay. You guys like this? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Mr. Hightoff made this fun. Yeah. Oh. I like how Mr. Hytoff made it fun, but not Mr. O. <laughs> Granted, Hytoff is goaded. He is much better than me at everything. Yes. He's a better jumper than me, too. <laughs> you guys are messed up. Why y'all laughing? <laughs> Dude, you guys are messed up. Dude, Mr. Hytoff is legit goaded. Jedwards is goaded too. I'm definitely the worst chem teacher in this department by far. It's true. They're goaded, dude. I'm like, like most of them are taller than me. First of all, they're all better looking than me. Um, they're all better jumpers than me for sure. Yeah, no, no. Those are the three important metrics that I use. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Nah, I don't know what I'm in that's, that's the only things that matter in life, guys. <laughs> Height, looks, and vertical jump. They got me beat. That's what qualifies you to be a chem teacher. Oh, I took it home for the weekend, and then I'm bringing it back. But it's two pieces, and so I didn't want to walk back to my car. Okay, uh, so we got N2H4 on the left side, so we got that good. Okay, let's move on to H2. Which reaction has H2 in it? Yeah, reaction tree, right? And we got to make sure that it's on the correct side of the arrow. And if so, if you take a look at it, it is on the correct side. Or three and four both have it, right? So uh, what we're going to want to do is we're going to use both three and four. So let's start by writing three. I'm going to write N2 gas plus three H2 gas. And then we have two N H three gas. So we're gonna have to rearrange the fourth one, but let's do three first. And the delta H here is negative forty six. Okay. All right. Now, if you guys take a look at it, uh, you'll also notice that reaction four has H two, right? And what's the problem with reaction four right now? It's yeah, it's on the wrong side. So we gotta flip it. But if we flip it, what do we need to do with enthalpy? Yeah. Yeah, change the sign to the opposite. So we're going to flip it. We'll get CH2O plus H2. Okay, and then we got to change it to positive 65. Okay. All right, now we just need to make sure that everything cancels out on the left and right side. And the thing that we have left over is reaction one, okay? Okay, so let's go through it. So we only want N2H4 and H2 on the left side. So we're gonna try to get rid of everything else. So let's start with this guy. We don't want this guy. 
And if you notice, we have CH4O liquid on the other side as well. So they cancel out. Uh, let's go to N2. We got an N2 right here. So this is going to cancel out with this one. We got three H2s. Three H2. So these guys can cancel out, which is fine because we still have one H2. And that's the number that we wanted. And then we have CH2O. Cancel out with CH2O. And then if we just copy down everything that's left over, and okay. 2 h4, we got 1 h2, and then we have 2 and h3. And so if you notice, it's exactly the same as reaction 1. Okay, so all we got to do is add these up, and that will give us the total enthalpy change. So if you get a total value of negative 18, you are good. Woohoo! Woohoo! Wasn't that so fun, guys? You might, yeah. Yeah. Nothing, it'll be part of a different FRQ or uh, there's actually MCQs like this. Yes, they may be. I don't know, though. If I could get the test leaks, then, you know, I'd give them to you. Actually, wait, I wouldn't, just on the record, because I'll compromise the integrity of the test. I would not do that. <laughs> Also, I have no way to get it. Anyway. Have you ever been one of the No. Got to do that. You said you were. Did I? Yeah. Oh, no. Did you lie? Like, I don't no. know. You lied to us? I Did I tell you that? It might have been for something else. I don't know. I have proctor I have graded tests like unofficial ones, but not um this. Anyway, let's move on. I don't know, dude. I don't know what I'm doing, but I would never do anything like that, guys. My summers are very important. I'm a professional athlete. Okay, let's uh let's do 13.8, and then we'll finish up for today. Okay, this is a MCQ, and it's a very conceptual one. Um, you don't need to do any math. Okay, so if you're doing math, you're doing something wrong, but. You'll have to look at the concepts and you'll have to use one of the equations we learned about last earlier. So I'll give you guys about three minutes to kind of think about this, figure it out, and then we'll go over the explanation and the answer in just a sec, okay? All right, so here we want to use the free energy reaction. And then we're just going to play with the variables, no straight numbers to just kind of figure out um, what's going on, okay? So um, the only information that you, you're given here is that this reaction right here, um, the enthalpy is a negative value. Okay, that's all the information that we're given. And then it's asking you, hey, if you have this same, if you have this reaction, okay, and we said that this is going to be a negative number right here, right? Enthalpy is a negative number. If we increase the temperature, uh, what's going to happen to the Gibbs free energy? Okay, so this right here. Okay, so let's think about this, okay? We don't know anything about S, but we, what we can figure out is that, uh, is that this isn't really going to matter, okay? Okay, we don't need to worry about S very much. All we need to do is think about what happens to G if we make T bigger. So if we make T bigger, does G become more negative or more positive? Yeah, it's going to become more negative. And the reason why is because T becomes a bigger number. So for example, let's uh, let's just kind of do this in our head. Like, let's just make up some numbers. If this was one, right? We can say that this was like, this ends up becoming negative one or something like that. But if we make this a bigger number, like 10, then that means this number is going to get greater as well. And the reason why is because you're subtracting uh, a bigger number. So this is going to become uh, more negative. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, just by that, we can take out B and D. Okay, now all we need to do is take a look at A and C. Okay, and here, if you take a look at it, what we can do is take a look at the reaction, and that will allow... Okay, that, that will allow us um, to figure out which one is correct, A and C. So, C is not the right answer, and the reason why is because... We're talking about the spontaneity of a reaction, right? If we're talking about if a reaction is spontaneous, we're looking at the, the factors that make the reactants basically react together. 
And if you take a look at C, it's talking about the gases, right? But gases are talking about which side of the reaction, the product side, right? So since C is not talking about the reactants, it can't be C. And so your answer has to be A because all the gases are on the product side. Okay, so if that didn't make sense, just let me repeat myself. When we're talking about spontane spontaneity, basically, will a reaction proceed? If we proceed a reaction, we're going from reactant to product, right? So we're looking at what is going to affect the reactants. doesn't matter if the gases are higher pressure. If none of the reactants are gases. They're all products. And so that's why C is an incorrect answer because all the gases are products. But spontaneity has to do with whether the reactants are going to react. Okay. Okay.